Oh, that, that, that one. Which one? The one that we always sing together. Which one's that? The one with the mountains and the fatty. Ain't no mountain high enough? Yes, that, that's the song. Ain't, Ain't no, no mountain, mountain high, high enough. enough. Ain't no valley low enough. Ain't no river wide enough to keep me from loving you, babe. That's about all we knew of that one, I think. saw my face, what were you feeling? Well, boy, that's 20 years ago now. I know. Um, <laughs> I loved your face from the very beginning. There was this kind of noise going on in the background that you might have Down syndrome. There was a lot of noise, but I was kind of just tuning it out and uh, thinking what a beautiful baby you were. Hi, Emery. What do you think, Emery? I like it. You like it? Yeah. Say meow. Bye. Emery Kevin reporting news. Dog. I'm Emery. I am a coffee lover. <laughs> Lover and a Gamma Girls lover. The Gamma Girls, Gamma Girls. The Gamma Girls. It's my favorite TV show to mankind. And I have Down syndrome. What does it feel like to have a Down syndrome? Wow. It feels like it's a part of me. I still live the life that I, st I do every day. I do my, norm my normal routine in the morning and at night, and I go to work. And I feel like that I'm just being me, who I am, but with an extra common sound. Howdy, welcome to Howdy Homemade Ice Cream. When I'm working out, I usually my headphones on and listen to music. You got it. <laughs> she wrote some songs. She sang some songs that she wrote, remember? Let loose enjoy the moment. Oh yeah, enjoy the moment. Like you never done before. before. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> like you never done before. Like that you never done before. Like, like you, you never, never done, done before. before. Like you never done before. You never done, done before. before. There was a lot of a lot of that line. <laughs> there was a little bit of repetition in the song.
with Palmer, yeah, I think it was a huge shock, a big surprise for us. I had a pretty typical pregnancy and instantly when she was when she was born, she came out, I, I overheard one of the nurses say something to the doctor that was delivering her and the doctor said, yeah, I see it. And so I heard that, and what, what does she see? And there's some signs that lead us to believe that your daughter has Down syndrome. Instantly, she was categorized as other, different. The message from, let's say, the touch of your finger to your brain is just traveling a little slower than it might be for someone who okay. has tone within normal limits. Not normal. It's difficult to live that with Down syndrome sometimes. What are you staring at and pointing at? And that's very, very difficult to me. Being labeled as that Down syndrome girl makes me feel like I'm worthless and completely useless. You have to depend on your parents for everything you do. Like I'm going out to get groceries or going out and get my brother a nice birthday car but kind out loud. How to spell composition? Hello? Did you accidentally summon me? Do you know how to spell composition? I don't understand. Seeing who I am and that I have Down syndrome and I hate every time I say it and seeing that I have it is not what I think I'm supposed to be. But I know I have it, but I hate it. Never helps me. I honestly don't feel normal. I don't feel normal. What is normal? Normal. 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 Okay. Normal. Not me. <laughs> we really can't put a word on normal. I mean, it's so many different things. The word normal could mean common among society. If I were to define it, it's a standard. A set of standards that everyone follows. Your everyday life. Just being neutral. The same thing over and over again. My version of normal is like what I do day to day. Normal actually can be a little bit as well boring. <laughs> it's better to be interesting or some kind of difference. I feel normal is hard to define because it's so individualistic and self-referencing. Normal changes from day to day, from relationship to relationship. I think it's what you're used to. I think normal is really in the eye of the beholder. The word normal? I just don't know if there is a normal. I think everything is normal. Whoever you are, that's normal. Do I consider myself normal? No. <laughs> As of right now, no one knows what normal really is right now. Sometimes we, we need to compare things just to understand them. I do think the word normal can, can cause problems when compared to others because People, I feel, rarely use it as just a descriptor. There's a bit of a, a value judgment that comes with it, where normal is good and abnormal is bad. The real definition of normal is everyone, to be honest. There's kind of that lack of empathy for people who aren't in that version of normal. You never know what's going to be normal tomorrow. I don't consider myself normal because I don't know what normal is.
I'm Chris Berry. I'm a family medicine physician. I work in public health. In undergraduate, I studied physics and nuclear engineering and served in the Army. So I have a, a definite interest in science and also in humanity and helping people. In healthcare, we use normal values all the time. Normal values for lab results tell us if there's a problem going on with a patient and we need to know if something falls outside of normal, they might need a special treatment. Uh, it might be an emergency. If one value is abnormal called a troponin, it means the person's having a heart attack. But the fact that someone has a high troponin level doesn't mean that that person has more dignity or worth or less dignity or worth than someone else. So it's, it's necessary, we use it all the time, it's critical for us, but I think it's different than, than the word normal can be used sometimes outside of the scientific world. Grappling with normal once Penny was born, we expected to have a normal daughter because we didn't know ahead of time that Penny was going to have Down syndrome. And so we got this beautiful child who wasn't what we expected. What, what is it like when you have Down syndrome? It's cool. Cool? She would love to know some people who are older than her who oh, have Down wow. syndrome. So it's really sweet that you're here and that you're coming. And okay. Yeah, yeah, it's very nice. That's where you have to be. We hustle. From 5 to 6.30. From 5 to 7.30. Right, from 5 to 7.30 to <laughs> rehearsal. That's right. Penny is a lot like her mom. Like She's going to work really hard and she cares about things. And yet she's not going to end up in the same place academically as I did. Lots of people talk about when you have a child with a disability and you first learn about that, there's a process of grief. And for us, certainly, there was a grieving process. But there was another grief that emerged. That was the grief of having to see the part of me that needed to die in order to receive her as a gift. Happy birthday, dear Palmer. There, there was this... I think the confusion mixed in with the joy and there was a little bit of grief, I think, grieving. She's not going to be these things that we had talked about her being. What for you has been the hardest thing about having Down syndrome? Struggling of being alone. I always wanted you to have lots of friends. As many friends as I had. Did, do you know that I'm fighting alone, aloneness? Yes, I do. Does it hurt you seeing me being alone? To the core. I hate it. It hurts me more than anything. I hate being alone. I hate seeing that my brother is going bar hopping and I'm stuck in my room watching Netflix for crying out loud. That makes me hurt so bad. Why is that? Why? Well. <laughs> I hate it so much. I hate it. I love you, baby. <laughs> Her, it hurts her to the core, too. If we could take that pain away from you, we would take it in a minute. Why does God want me to do this? Oh, honey, I don't know. I don't understand. Mm. We've just got to keep trusting. We've got to keep trusting. Trust in God and you. Trust in God, Lord, not me. I 
I think science is a, it's a way of trying to understand what we see happening around us, but it's not able to uh, answer questions about, um, about value, actually, about what's right, what's wrong. It's really more about what are the facts, what, what's there in front of us. So like an example could be, science is absolutely essential and necessary in math in predicting where the eclipse was going to incur and where you should be sitting to watch it happen. But it was powerless to actually create any prediction of awe or wonder or amazement of what it was really going to look like, what it was going to feel like to be there and to see it. Here in Nashville, Tennessee, we are filming the solar eclipse. How does it make you feel? I feel like that dark, that darkness. I want that darkness to fade away. Pay the way darkness in my life. <laughs> and let the sun appear. Come on! No! <laughs> Come on, son! I want to become you. I want that summer in my life. Not the darkness! Come on! Don't give up on me. Don't. Don't give up on me. I hate giving up. Don't. 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 Don't you dare. Don't quit on me. Don't quit on me. Don't. Don't you quit on me. No matter what happens, do not hold this table down. Lift up the tablecloth so you can actually see the table underneath. Whoa, okay, all right, just stay right there, stay right there. Well, my name is Harris III. It's a weird name, it really is my name. I'm an illusionist, storyteller, speaker, communicator. I do a lot of things, but more than anything else, I help people reawaken wonder and hopefully help them believe in what I like to call real magic. The principles of deception that people like me use to trick people like you in the context of a magic show are the exact same principles used to persuade us to believe anything. We get tricked into believing stuff that's not true. It changes the way we see ourselves in the mirror. And after all, we think we can trust it all because seeing is believing. Yeah, apparently. Problem is what I do for a living proves that seeing is not always believing because things are not always as they seem. Let me show you what I mean. I've got a card, I've drawn some spots on both sides of this card. I'm gonna show you both sides. Just remember how many spots you see. There's one spot on this side, four spots on that side. Pretty simple. Three spots on this side. Remember, six spots on this side one spot right over here. Okay, <laughs> every time I do this, there's always a few people who sort of start to nod and grin a little bit. You're like, that's an optical illusion. I think I've got this figured out. An illusion is something fake that seems very real. Something that is perceived to be real that is actually a counterfeit version of reality. I really want to understand Down syndrome, but I really, really haven't really grasped the idea that I, I have Down syndrome. Do you think that that's that? Do you think that that's a part of my problem and Dad's problem of trying to make you be so normal <laughs> and those normal experiences that maybe we did you a disservice by not? explaining more along the way, hey, you know, you may, you're may you going to learn, but it's going to be slower. Would that have been better and made you more prepared to live that way? Definitely. 
more details, I can finally grasp the idea of what I can do. Don't tempt all around me, just tell me the hard truth. Well, I think we are kind of doing it now. Now, but not when I was like five years old. Well, I didn't know when. When you were five years old, do you think you were ready? Yes. You were just tell me the truth and I would understand it better. Could you explain what Down syndrome is? Sure, I can try. Um, Could you describe it as a book? Because I love to read books so I can understand it better. Sure, yeah. So, our DNA is like a book. And every single cell in our body, our hair, our eyes, our skin, has a tiny little copy of a book. It actually has two copies, one from our biological mother and one from our biological father. And there's 23 chapters of instructions of how our bodies are supposed to work. And someone with Down syndrome has an extra chapter, 21, in one of the two books. And as the body's taking instructions, it's looking at two copies of chapter 21, and that makes some of the differences that we see in someone with Down syndrome show up. I love doing what I do. I work with little kids. I work with kids who have Down syndrome and who, are, who need help with their sounds. You know how some people cannot say their S sound and R and yes. L? <laughs> I don't like my Does that R frustrate sounds. you? It does. Yeah. I just say it again and again and again to make sure they understand what I'm trying to say to them. It kind of frustrates me and it makes me feel like I'm worth it. Um, like, it, make you, it makes you want to give up? And yeah. I see people seeing me but not actually seeing who I really am. Do you think that's because something has deceived them? I hope so, but they just walk past me and don't even look at me. When I say the word they, I want to say the people outside of my group are the, are the normies. I use the word normie as to describe the people who are not Down syndrome. Normal people. I want to be seen the same way that you want to be seen. And what's crazy is, I bet you look at me and you think, well, he's seen by lots of people. He's kind of got it all together. <laughs> he's not weird like I am. But would you believe me if I told you that so many times in my life, I've felt exactly the way that you felt, that I've felt invisible, that I don't feel like people see me. You know, growing up in a small town, I got bullied a lot for being different and picked on because I wasn't good at sports. And nobody wanted to come sit with me. But, but, if I reached into my pocket, if I pulled out a deck of cards or a piece of rope, if I started doing magic tricks, Everything changed. All of a sudden, all the popular kids in my school, they wanted to come and sit at my table. All the really hot, good-looking girls in my school still would not come sit at my table. <laughs> I started becoming one of those popular people in my school. By the time I turned 18, I had performed in almost all 50 states. By the time I was 21, I'd made a million dollars. My new wife and I, we built this big fancy house in Franklin, the wealthiest suburb of our state. Filled it up with cool stuff, parked two nice expensive cars in my driveway. The problem is I went to bed every single night feeling totally empty, still feeling insecure, still looking at myself in the mirror going, you're still that same weirdo that everybody bullied when you were a little kid. Didn't feel like it was enough. Didn't feel like I was enough. Oh, but if you had one of these, they say, you could show the world that you are enough and that you have what it takes.
I think the idea of normal is, is, is very subjective. I don't think there's anything normative about how I function. I've broke records in my family for how long I've been married to my wife, and we're quirky, and some of that quirk comes from brokenness when I was young. And like, I even, as a pastor, I look at the life of Jesus, and I, don't, I mean, it wasn't normal. <laughs> <laughs> so it's part of why people followed him because <laughs> it wasn't like anyone else. So, so what is normal then? Like if you don't even have a, if you don't have a ground zero. David Woods can hurt people's feelings in the Down syndrome area. Some was like retard and um, being flawed and limited is like that in the Down syndrome field. Mm. Why would you put the word limited in the same category as something as derogatory as retarded? Because I see myself as limited, so I'm just curious. I, I, I don't fully understand why that would be a hard word for people that have Down syndrome. Limited is the best way on describing it is like, um, you, that child is not able to do what they want to do in, the, in their day-to-day -day lives. Right. I, I recognize, and I think it's good to hear from you, of how those within the Down syndrome community and families of Down syndrome could, could take great offense to language like flawed or broken or limited. But I think if we were to back that up and really think about those terms in a broader way, I, I actually think that those words are, are, are universal words for the human experience. Normal, I mean, wow. Normal. Normal. Am I normal? You know, I'm the only one in the world probably doing this as a full-time job, so that doesn't make me normal, I guess. If you get up every morning and you fight for it, then you're normal. For me, saying that I'm not normal is like finding out that this guy who looks like an average Joe is really autistic, has ADHD, and has a language process disorder. As I was growing up, I had some uh, muscle dystrophy, so I had to kind of learn to not have to worry about how I look compared to everybody else. There is this disturbance of peace. I, I do have an autopilot autism when I basically talk about something. And then all of a sudden, my mother is telling me, like, scream. And I'm like, was I? I have a few people in my family. Some are autistic. Um, I try to treat them the same way I treat everybody else. When it comes to judging others, I definitely do not do well with that. The people have a preconceived perception of what they think society should look like that is problematic. Do I what? Um, mislead or says people? I, I probably do. I had curly hair and dark hair and everyone had straight hair and blonde and everyone was stick board thin and I always wasn't. What do I fear most? Loneliness, not being heard, not being seen. Getting mocked. For me, uh, I do feel lonely sometimes. Uh, I'm a young guy, I'm 20, and a lot of my time is spent focusing on myself and work, so it's just like social life and that kind of thing falls aside, so you do get lonely at times. Yeah. Am I the second Superman you interviewed? I can't be true, no. Even Superman struggles with loneliness. That's right. At first, I've mourned the loss of this child that I had made up in my mind. But now, knowing what I know, it is the complete opposite. And I think she's just um, helping us really redefine what we would think as normal. What I like to believe, what I, what I want to believe, is that I assign equal human value to all people just by the fact that they're alive. I think the truth is, though, a lot of times I do assign value based on what people can do, a lot of times what people can do for me. And so that's, that's a reality that's at play as well. <laughs> The hardest 
parts about having a daughter with Down syndrome is it's not necessarily what we've already had to experience, it's the fears of what we might have to experience. Like a simple cold could turn into a hospital stay easily. Last winter, she just got a common cold that both of my daughters got, but Palmer ended up in the hospital for two or three nights stay because it turned to pneumonia. And there's a lot of fear around that. And we have to get her blood work taken more frequently to make sure she didn't have leukemia. And she does therapies multiple times a week. And so just the actual monetary expense of that is a lot, but then also just the time and the emotional bandwidth that that takes to sort of manage all of that. I worry a lot about her future and with friends or at school or what her life as an adult is going to look like. And I don't have those thoughts for my other children. I just assume things will go more typically with my other children. <laughs> I idolize this, this idealistic vision for my life. And it's not that I don't have expectations or dreams or hopes for Palmer. I just think I realize that the things I, I struggle to and find value in aren't why I value her. It helps free me up to dispel those illusions and lies about how I love other people, about how I love myself, about how I love my other children, or, or you. You're doing a handstand, all right, let's see it. Okay, you're good. That was not your best ever. Try again. Beautiful. Um, Can I could possibly do it? I did say possibly, but we gotta get in ballet clothes, we need yeah. to practice piano. Yeah. I recently have noticed with Penny that I am pushing her to get everything done on time a lot. You know, getting everything done and getting it done right and getting it done well and not forgetting stuff and not having a mess ever, you know? And it's like, well, wait, why do you need that so much? Why can't you let your daughter lie on her bed and just lie there for a while? Why does she have to be doing something? If you see, not me, another person, working on by the house down syndrome. What do you think? Quite honestly, I compare and I oftentimes think, wow, I'm not sure that person can do all the things that Anne Marie can do. Other down syndrome people could have speech defects. I don't have that. I don't, I don't have speech today defects or the looks of it. And I am an upper level. I don't have ticks. I don't. People that we don't have Down syndrome, they see us doing those kind of things. And they think that we're hurting ourselves. Who says that? People that what we call them no means. And if I'm in a one hall thing, has, everyone has Down syndrome, I feel quarantined. When you're with other people with Down syndrome. Yes. To hear you, Emery, talking about people that are like lesser than or lower level of Down syndrome, um, honestly, it really it hurt. It hurts me, as Palmer's mom. I don't compare them. I'm just facing the truth. The truth that they have ticks. What is a tick? A tick, like a, a noticeable thing. Do you know you have ticks? I don't have ticks. Down syndrome's one thing. Grinding my teeth is, is a tick, but it's not of Down syndrome. So what? Like, why does it matter if it's a result of Down syndrome or not? I don't know what you're trying to do in my head right now. Um, showing weakness or something probably in Down syndrome. Do you think showing weakness would be giving up? Yes. If you were to get in a car accident and you were no longer able to walk or you were no longer able to get up on stage and speak and advocate the way that you want to, I don't believe that would change your worth or value at all. Okay. It's 
hopeful for me to realise I have tits because that would tell me that I am not normal. We did the test. I think it took a couple weeks to get the results. So during that two weeks, we just researched everything we could about chromosome abnormalities. The prevailing mindset of the Down syndrome parent community was, your child has no limits. They can do whatever they want to do. They're just like anybody else. And that's just not true. You know, it's just not true. But I don't care what you say. When your daughter comes home and says, I want to try out for the cheerleader squad, I can't tell you how many times I found myself saying to myself, I don't know what to do here. I don't know what to say, because everything I can think of to say sucks. People with Down syndrome, they tend to get self-awareness around puberty and that puts them a little behind on their social learning curve. Some families who believe um, anything is possible, they go around setting a course of goals that are unrealistic. I don't want to stifle her you know, at all, but I also don't want to foster this delusion. Let the kid score a touchdown. Everybody get out of the way and let them score a touchdown and then put them up on your shoulders. Alex would love that. It would bother me as a dad. I don't want my kid to be a project. And I don't know if that's right or wrong. I don't know. Let me see, uh, Jillian, Jillian, let me see your tableau. Places, please. People would comment and they would say, well, you think she's cute now, just wait until she's a little bit older. Am I gonna be ashamed of my child? Am I gonna be embarrassed? Are her accomplishments gonna be tied up with my love for her? And I think that got stripped away pretty early on, and I hope is part of what has enabled her to actually really thrive. To say, we don't know who you're gonna be, but we know we love you. From an early age, I was always told I can do whatever I want, that I can be anything I put my mind to. I even went through a stage where I was in a band where it was really popular for a year. But two years later, nobody even remembered our name. I thought, I'll be famous by the time I'm 24. And then I was 24, and then I'm like, well, I have to be famous by the time I'm 28. And then I was 28. And then I was famous. No, I was never famous. <laughs> so it didn't happen. And so, so I started creating that despair. I'm like, what if this thing doesn't happen? And that's, I think that those are the kinds of limitations and the boundaries and the frustrations that we're confronted with. Like you're all of a sudden realizing that you're not going to achieve everything that you thought you would achieve when you were 20. Just go slow. At first, just kind of get used to what it feels like. That's it. Just do that for a bit. Whoops. See? That's okay. Just kind of, yeah, just kind of taking steps. Just like taking steps. Exactly. Do that for a bit. Then try a little bit of power. Let off. Let off. Let off. That's okay. I think we need to do it tandem. Showing weakness is one thing that I do not like because it will take away the great opportunities that I've been accepting and new opportunities that I've been gaining. 
I can actually get down to business and try to stay focused on my job prospects. You pay my bills. Yeah? I want to pay my own bills. I pay your brother's bills too, but he doesn't seem to mind that. I want to be like, fully independent. If there's a thousand dollars on this table right here right now, I was putting on either coffee, coffee or books. I, I can fully relate to that. Yeah. Essential oils. Yes! $165 for essential oils. Well, how many hours it takes you to make $165? Two and a half months. No, it's not quite that long. Yes. There's a mold in my apartment on you now. See, right now I think you're blowing smoke. What is smoke? Up my dress. Not really, it's just my first place. I'm sorry, Amy May, these numbers just, they're kind of scary. I mean, the Ubers alone are killing me. So eight times four, remember what that is? I hate math. I know. Four times 16? eight. That's kind of close. I hate math. That's okay. Entertainment. Coffee is not entertainment. Okay. It's a need. We'll put coffee in the food group. It looks like we spent a hundred dollars mm. in the last three days. Your budget is three hundred dollars for a whole month. Yes, so I got two hundred left. So who has been bailing you out? You. Obviously, that's why I don't about you. Mm-hmm. And there you have it. There's the issue. I think that what you're actually describing is not so much overcoming limitation, but it's actually desiring more freedom. You want to be more free. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And here's the thing is that our freedom is actually enjoyed in limitations. So, you're, so let me give you an example. When I said yes to my wife, I said no to every other woman. The joy of my marriage came through the limitation. I can't have Darcy and every other and every woman that lives, right? You, you could, but do I figure it, would, it would be out. it would be bad. Yeah, it would be bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good hug. Oddly to say, I fantasize about being an empty nester <laughs> one day, and Palmer has challenged that. Is that normal to think this way? The, I totally think that way. Until I die, she is gonna be my child. Where the grudgingness comes out, because it certainly has, uh, as I've thought about that, that has more to do with my own stuff, less to do with the reality of the situation. It's challenged us to reframe what we think life should be like. So if we move to an apartment in, the, in a city one day and she has the apartment across the hall, why is that not a better actual option than the hyper-independent, just the two of us, empty nest uh, type, type life? What I would hope for Penny, and for all of our kids, honestly, is not lives of fierce independence, but of interdependence. It acts back on us and helps us imagine actually maybe a fuller life than we would have imagined if we didn't have Penny in our lives.
I'm still feel lonely, mm -hmm. and I don't have a family. You want a family. You you want to have a husband and a baby. Yeah. Mm hmm. Having someone next to me to be there, right next to me, mm -hmm. and telling me that I'm worth it. Mm hmm. I hate being alone and scary and it hurts. Mm hmm. Yeah. Do you want to have a child? I do, yes. I do. Honestly, if I'm honest, I think that's my greatest fear with Palmer, that she will desire to be a mom. And that might not be what's best for her. I want to love a child. It could help me not being lonely anymore. And Marie, trust me, I get the desire to want to have a family. My parents divorced when I was young, and I really chased after this dream of starting over fresh. And I'm only 34, but none of those things have solved that problem yet. Me having Down syndrome, does that affect having a relationship with somebody? I think it could. If it's someone who hasn't come to terms with the fact that they have their own abnormalities, then it's harder for them to connect. And Down syndrome is a reminder to them of their own problems, their own things. Even if it's not something that's right there in front of them right now, it's going to happen someday. Every single person has imperfections in their DNA, and some of those imperfections are bad in the sense that they're going to lead to sickness or suffering or pain. But some of those imperfections are just what make us human and make us diverse and different and connect to one another and understand one another. It kind of represents like the, the flaws that we can't deny about ourselves. And if I can face that and be honest about that, I think that's a doorway into maybe being able to love other people. What I'm understanding is that Down syndrome is a big flaw in your book. I do believe that from a scientific point of view. Why? So maybe we need to talk about what I mean by flaw. You have an extra chapter 21 in your instruction manual. And that is going to lead to certain challenges in terms of how your mind works, in terms of some things that can happen with your heart. So that's what I mean. What I don't mean is that it makes someone have less value. It feels like you're judging me at this time. Judging you? Yes. Your worth and your value, in my mind, are not connected at all to how many chromosomes you have. Not at all. Okay. That's what I'm banking on, because in the end, I know that one of these days, my book is going to have some kind of a word scramble that's going to cause me to have cancer or cause something to go in my life that makes me get sick or maybe makes me die. And so my worth has to be based on something besides the book and what's in it or not in it. That's the kind of love I'm looking for in life. And I hope the same for you. So please um, forgive me if I left you the impression that I think that there's anything less valuable about you because you have an extra copy of chromosome 21. I think that would be crazy. You are just as lovely and beautiful and worthy of love as anyone in this beautiful park around us. I absolutely believe that. What do I think gives a person value? Oh, it's, it's all about their actions. What justifies my existence? That's tough, actually. I think what gives value to a human being is life itself. Actually, I don't think I know what justifies my existence, or anyone's. How do you find love? Unconditional. My family. Family, that's yes. a good one. My family. I think that we all have a feeling that our love that we have for other people, other things, 
are not at all normal, it's something extraordinary. Love is taking the act of kindness and spreading it wherever you go. I love this person and I feel like I'm my most beautiful self when I'm with this person right now. Well now I have to say something really good. <laughs> if someone proves that they're interested in, in who I am as a person and seeks me out, that's what gives a person value. I believe another human being has value just because they exist. I believe that we're all created in God's image, but we are all different. God did make us different. I just enjoy who I am. I'm good the way that I am. I compare myself to other people all the time, and I wish I could stop. I stopped really caring about being like other people or doing what other people think is acceptable. Express my opinion, see if they'll like it, and if they don't, I don't know what to tell you. And sort of seeing someone for their unique qualities and embracing all of that is, is what is beautiful about love. I can definitely agree with that. <laughs> Everyone has value. Everyone has a point to until you lose it. You're set. Everything you could want from a Portland restaurant. <laughs> Good. I will have a glass of rosé, actually. I'm not gonna drink the Akrad at lunch. That's not that's not who I am, so <laughs> Oh don't don't make me feel guilty. <laughs> Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Before I turned like 14 years old, I thought I was I keep on denying the fact that I have Down syndrome. It's like half of me is Down syndrome and half of me is who I am actually. Mm -hmm. And so I feel invisible halfway. Right. What I believe is that everything's broken. Everything is broken. It's like one of the laws of the universe. Everything's breaking down. And that fallenness means that sometimes people are born with a gene that's not quite right, that creates Down syndrome. That's not a mistake. That's just the outworking of brokenness. You aren't Down syndrome. You are, you're Anne Marie. Right. And just like my mom is not arthritis, she's she's Shelly, uh, but she has really severe arthritis. <laughs> right. Do you think that God that actually wanted to put me on this earth for a reason instead of going the other way around? Yeah, he definitely wants you on the earth for a reason, and he and he created you as a person, as Anne Marie. But Anne Marie is a, is a young woman born into a fallen world, which includes fallen bodies and fallen minds. <laughs> we can say to Anne Marie or to someone else who has any number of flawed DNA syndromes that they're of equal value, but but a lot of times what they experience in the world is that they're treated as if they don't have equal value. And someone who has an extra 21st chromosome is not able to cover up their abnormalities as well as I can. I think that people who don't have those things happening in their lives are able to, to cover it up. And then that, that functions as a, a barrier to love. It's really uh, almost like a journey that we're on as, as humanity to, to, to get to a place uh, where we love people not for what they can or can't do, what their function or capability is, but we love people purely just because they're human. She's facing things now that I didn't overcome until my 40s. So I'll say, so Anne Marie is just learning this at a much earlier phase in life, right? And that's good, right? And then there's a part of me that says, no, I kind of wish she could have those fantasies for a little bit longer, like most of us. We gotta take a crash course, Anne Marie, and what, what to hope in. You said there's the part of me that's Down syndrome, but then there's Anne Marie. And and I think that there may be this part of you that you don't you don't like, 
And I do believe that that is at the root of what creates so much loneliness is because the thing that our culture teaches us and tells us constantly is what? Like, you can be anything you want to be. You can do anything you want to do. That The world is about you. And when we put ourselves at the center of the universe, it gets very lonely. I think there's a difference between brokenness and limitations. And I think that we think they're the same thing, but they're not. When I started to see that I have brokenness and I have limitations, it really helped me. Because brokenness comes from sin. It is what is wrong with the world. It is what causes pain and separation and loneliness. And we want that to be gone. It won't be, but that's what love is about. That is what God is about, is healing those wounds. And when all of that is done, we will still be limited, vulnerable, needy, dependent human beings. Anytime anyone honestly looks at their own heart, they're, they're generally gonna find something that they dislike. And I'm primarily thinking about myself and about what's best for me and how do I overcome this. I think that the way I actually tend to overcome my limitations on some level is by not thinking about them and focusing on the person in front of me. Okay. So, so tell me what you hear me saying. <laughs> um, I heard you saying, well, that's like one huge swoop of information that my brain doesn't process it for, for not very, very long time. Everyone is limited. If everyone is limited, is limited then a bad word? No. No, it's not. To be limited, to accept our limitations actually is, the, is I think, the path to how we become free. Think about that. <laughs> that is a mind explosion. Try it again. Here we go. One, four, three, six, one. Okay, you're not going to hurt my feelings. Show of hands. How many of you feel like you've already figured out the secret to how this trick works? Nice, like six people. Okay, all right, let me explain how this works. This is a simple optical illusion. Most of you know I actually have two spots, right? If I were to hold up this card and be like, hey, check out this card, how many spots do you see? You would answer by saying, I see two. Yeah, the trick wouldn't work, because I need you to see three. If I want to trick you tonight, I don't want you to think, I just tell you what I want you to think. Crazy, but that's how simple it is. Looks like four, they're actually five. Put my hand here and say four, your mind sees four. Put my hand over here on this side and <laughs> say, some of you just caught on. That is awesome. All right. Well done, bartender. I put my hand on this side and say six. You guys will actually see six, even though there's only five. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. yeah, like that's how illusions work. I think having tens of thousands of followers online created the illusion of connection and love. But I realized that that was just an illusion but that love and connection was real. I just had to learn what the real thing felt like. The reason I say it's so easy to be deceived and that seeing is not always believing, well, some people look at this card long enough, they actually see three spots on this side of the card. I know it's crazy, but it's true. Some people actually see six spots on this side of the card. <laughs> you're right, there are three. There are six. Sometimes the more you look at this thing, the more spots you're actually gonna see. That is an example of an illusion. I'll tell you what, give yourselves a round of applause for following along with that. You did pretty well, I'm impressed. Impressed for real. <laughs> love is something that everyone hopes for. Love is something that is real, that some people think is just an illusion. Will you still love me? When my love lingers elsewhere Love is such a, such an overused word, but it's the most important value in what drives me in my music and what drives me in my path as a, as a, as a pastor. 
and because of my insecurities and because of my limitations, love is also the most challenging component. For me personally, it's hard to believe that I am personally lovable. The most fundamental basic truth from the perspective of a Christian is that God really loves me. That is still to this day, even as a minister that tells people that all the time, it's the hardest thing for me to personally accept. I came to faith at 28 and it was a God that pursued me in the midst of just unbelievable arrogance, unbelievable pride, a willingness to take advantage of anyone to get what I wanted. Um, and yet what I discovered was a, was a Jesus that said, come to me all you who are weary. And I'm like, man, I am tired. And the thing that I'm most worn out by is myself. So for me, the appeal of the gospel is actually the thing that offends most people, which is I can't save myself. That on my worst stinking day, God is crazy about me. The reality is for me is um, living with Down syndrome and accepting who I am. What are you afraid is going to happen if you fully accept? It'll be a huge new era for me, a new, a new beginning in my life. I can actually start living my life with Down syndrome. Well, you sound excited when you say yeah. that. So what's, what's, what's fearful about it? It's actually coming alive. It's actually coming true. That's a, that sounds like a good thing. It is, but I'm scared for that. I'm scared, like, oh, wow. It's like, how could you? What happens when we can't communicate with one another is that it, it makes us feel what? Alone. Right. You long for a particular kind of relationship and you may or may not get that relationship, but you have relationships. Push into those things, push outside of yourself, get out of your head and into the moment. How I am made is not as someone who needs to become superhuman and overcome all of my limitations. What I think Penny has helped me to see and learn is that that's an illusion. In trying to not be a limited human being, I become more of a broken human being because I'm cutting myself off from relationships and from love. What is love then? Is love understanding each other? That, that makes it contingent. And whether Anne Marie understands or not, doesn't change the fact that we can have real meaningful relationship and it doesn't change the fact that she's loved. So the, then the real question is how do we love each other in our brokenness? So even for you to say I'm not totally getting it like that's good. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yes. What do you want to see in your life? Peace. Do you think it's possible? No. What if, in order to see peace, you had to believe in it? Believe in peace? How is that even possible? That's, that's what I love about magic tricks. What we believe changes what we see. And if you believe the truth about who you are, that you are beautiful, that you are talented, that you are worthy of love, and that belief will change the reflection that you see may not seem like it, but things are not always as they seem. My hope when I perform illusions is that people will see that I love the skin that I'm in and I've grown comfortable with who I am and the fact that I'm weird and different and that I've given up on settling for the status quo or the illusion of normal. Well, I travel around the world, fast forward 10 years. I've seen the Taj Mahal, I've seen the pyramids in Egypt three times on tours in the Middle East. The first time I saw the pyramids, I was like, 
Wow, they really are a wonder of the world. This is incredible. It filled me with wonder. I was in awe, but the second time I saw the pyramids, two years later, I was like, huh. It was less wow and more how. Came back thinking, well, I've been there, done that. I've now seen all the magic that the world has to offer, so there's no really a point in believing in magic anymore. Well, then I became a dad. My wife gave birth to my very first kid. His name is Jude. And then when I was ready to quit and hang up my proverbial top hat, I looked down at Jude and his eyes were filled with wonder because I realized he was seeing magic everywhere. And it reawakened wonder in me and reminded me why I do magic. And nothing about her is a mistake. And Palmer's helped me redefine where I find worth and value in other people. Pre-Palmer, I wouldn't have chosen to have a child with Down syndrome or any disability for that matter. There was this switch that happened almost instantaneously for me that I, I immediately loved her and everything about her and how she was made. And as he started getting older, he saw magic everywhere. Like we would sit on the back deck and blow bubbles. And to me, it was mundane. It was just bubbles. But I realized Jude wasn't seeing bubbles. He was seeing magic. And that's when I realized that the stuff that you see me do isn't magic. They're just tricks. They are just illusions. Magic is that thing you felt. You got a little glimpse of that childlike wonder. Oftentimes when I'm looking at Palmer and seeing the gift that she is, and I, I've gotten to see how she's been a gift to others. And in those moments, it wipes away that, that, that bar, that level, that, that, that illusion of what I put on my kids or put on others or put on my friends. It, those, those moments take that away. I want to tell you something, Mama. You are special in your own way. You are beautiful. You are amazing. So I'm just gonna ask the question, what if your value as a human being, what if that stopped being placed on what other people thought about you? What if you just started finding your value as a human being and who you were and who you were made to be? And maybe how God sees you if you believe in it. What if we could recapture our childlike imagination and believe that anything is possible? Do you remember snow? Is this the first time you played in snow, Anne Marie? It is? <laughs>
It's no secret We all think the grass is so much greener on the other side And all we see is an image of ourselves Trapped in a future we can't reach On your fingertips is a moment you won't hold it. Where's your string? Too scared you'll break it. So I watch you draw blood from all the thoughts that wound your peace. But these two empty hands got a lot more to say. Then a mouth full of promises like maybe someday Yeah, these two empty hands may not have what it takes But if you threw it all away, would you be fine with what says? Hey Cause what stays is a mind 